Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Dexcom CEO answers your questions and looks ahead. Yep, we're already talking about the next generation, the transmitter sensor in one piece, the very small G7. They want something smaller. They want something connected. They want something powerful, accurate, and and literally that you won't find very easily if, if you're wearing it. And we think we've achieved uh, those goals as we've developed this product. Dexcom's Kevin Sayer also addresses issues with the current G6 sensors. We talk about what happened with the share servers New Year's Eve, Medicare, and much more. Plus, we check in with Beyond Type 1. A lot going on there. They've got a new CEO, Tom Shear, and a new push to help with Type 2. I talked to Tom a few weeks back. We talked about what makes Beyond Type 1 tick. And in our Tell Me Something Good segment, Will's Way, a small but mighty charity marking a big milestone. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to Diabetes Connections. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. So glad to have you along. I met a lot of new people at the Greater Western Carolinas Summit, the JDRF Summit that I attended recently. Thank you all so much. It was great to talk to you and, and meet some of you for the first time. That's my backyard, so I did know a lot of people, but even so, really appreciate the feedback on the podcast. A lot of people just talking about the in-person connections they were making that day, so important. And if you are new to the show, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. We do this week after week by doing interviews and talking to the movers and shakers in our community, as well as everyday people living with type 1. My son was diagnosed right before he turned 2 back in 2006. And if I can brag on Benny for just a moment, at the summit, he was Rufus. So, you know, the, the mascot of JDRF, the big teddy bear that has diabetes and you can give shots to, and a lot of kids use this uh, to get adjusted. And, you know, I know a lot of adults who still have their Rufus or who would really have liked one at diagnosis. But if you don't have one, uh, call your JDRF chapter if you didn't get a Rufus at your child's diagnosis. It makes a big difference. You know, kids learn so much through play. Uh, luckily, nobody tried to give Benny a shot while he was walking around the conference dressed as Rufus. But you know what? I'm so proud of him. He did great. He used to love Rufus. He was one of those kids that loved mascots. You know, he would, I have a bajillion pictures of him hugging, you know, the Syracuse Orange, Disney characters. I went to Syracuse. That kind of sounded weird if you don't know that. Um, you know, other mascots and, and characters and things like that. And he really played it up. So thank you again to everybody who attended and all your adorable kids who really had fun with Rufus. And I was proud of my daughter, Leah, as well. She doesn't come to as many diabetes events as when she was very little, but she helped us out in the booth. And that that was great. I did a session on using social media to thrive with diabetes rather than letting social media kind of push you around or get you down and comparing, you know, your diabetes to somebody else's. And that really went well. We had some terrific questions. And again, as I said, I met so many great people. So thanks for that. Looking forward to more conferences and meetups in the weeks to come. I also want to tell you a little bit about our latest endo visit. You know, like most kids with type 1, Benny goes quarterly. We had to give a little bit of extra time because of the holidays. So this was our first endo visit back since starting Untethered along with Basil IQ. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more at the end of the show. We have an awful lot to get to. I know that most of you are here to hear all the Dexcom news. So stick around at the very end. I'll come back on and talk about what we learned from Benny's Endo about our combination here about Traceba and Basal IQ and, and just some interesting information. All right. Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And if you're new, 
Uh, you may be wondering, wait a second, Dexcom is a sponsor. You're just about to talk to the CEO, Stacy. Well, you know, we do have a unique arrangement with all of our sponsors, and I think it's worth talking about for a moment. They are paying for the commercial and my endorsement within, but they do not tell me what to say in the show. Longtime listeners, I think you really understand this, and you will get the idea when you listen to the interview, I think. I don't think I pull any punches. You let me know what you think. But I do want to tell you about why we do love Dexcom and why I endorse them. We started with Dexcom back in the olden days, you know, before Share. So trust me when I say using the Share and Follow apps makes a big difference. Benny and I set parameters about when I'm going to call him or text him, how long to wait, that kind of stuff. It helps us talk and worry about diabetes less. And if he's at a sleepover, if he's away on a trip, it gives me so much peace of mind. It also helps if I need to troubleshoot with him because we can both see what's been happening over the last 24 hours and not just at one moment. The alerts and alarms that we set also help us from keeping the highs from getting too high and help us jump on lows before they're a big issue. Internet connectivity is required to access separate Dexcom follow app. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. It's been a good, even great year for Dexcom, but there are a lot of questions. I know because you, as you listen sent them to me. You sent me a bunch of questions when I told you who this week's guest was going to be. Everything from uh, the next generation tinier sensor to the latest on G6 and even what happened on New Year's Eve. So let's get right to it. I'm joined by Dexcom CEO Kevin Sayer. Kevin, thank you so much for coming back on. Thank you for having me today. Really appreciate you spending some time with us to answer these questions. And uh, let's just jump right into it. Talk to us a little bit, if you could, the news about the next generation tiny sensor. I know we want to answer questions about G6 and and what's happened. But, you know, I always like to jump in with the, the latest and greatest. So tell us a little bit about the partnership with Verily and this thinner disposable CGM. I'd be happy to talk about that. When we started that partnership effort back in 2015, we had a vision of really delivering to patients exactly what they wanted. They want something smaller. They want something connected. They want something powerful, accurate, and and literally that you won't find very easily if if you're wearing it. And we think we've achieved uh, those goals as we've developed this product. Uh, We are getting through that development cycle and getting to the point we're about to start manufacturing these things in earnest and testing them really hard, we disclosed at the J.P. Morgan conference, the financial conference, uh, just last week that we intend to launch that product in 2020 with the huge rollout in 2021, which means we've got a lot of work to do. But it is smaller. We are planning on it lasting at least two weeks. Everything in the system is disposable, so you won't have to buy transmitters anymore. I can tell your listeners will be very happy not to have to call us about transmitters or their insurance companies about transmitters and and the hardware because this is a component that people continually have a hard time understanding. Uh, It will be an easy insertion, actually fewer steps than G6. The packaging is smaller. Everything about it is going to lead to a, a wonderful patient experience. And so we are gearing up for that at the same time while we're trying to to scale up G6 to get that to more people as well. And all the things we've learned with G6, with its no calibration performance, with scaling up a manufacturing plant, with the automated insertion and everything, we're very fortunate to be able to apply these learnings into our G7 system, which is what we've officially started calling this next product. So it's really going to be what we always thought CGM should look like. Okay, before we go on to the G6, because as you mentioned already, a couple of questions there. With the G7, as we're calling this, when you say it's thinner anywhere on the body, easier insertion, I'm going to put some pictures of what has already been posted, you know, online about that. But what's been pictured isn't the actual product. It's not, there's, is there a prototype? prototype? It is a prototype. Okay. Those are prototypes that have been pictured, yes. Okay. And we will evolve that product over time. You know, we talk about the features that we look for in designing new products. And we have really three three pillars uh, of our design. And the first one is sensor performance. We always demand that our sensors perform the way that our patients want them to. The second one is is value. Uh, our, our, our products have to provide the value to patients that, that they're looking for. And what that means is we always look at taking costs out of the system. But on the other side, we always look at providing outcomes to the insurance companies or governmental payers, whoever pays for this, that they're expecting to see uh, in a medical device of this nature. And then the last one is convenience. 
we have built our company on performance uh, up to this point in time. That has been what we've been better than anybody else at. And we'll never allow a sensor to come out that isn't, doesn't perform well. But what you're seeing with G6 and then coming with G7 is more em- emphasis on these other two areas, uh, whereby we're going to take cost out of this. We're going to make the product last longer because that's what patients have wanted. We're going to make it more convenient to put on your body. We're going to connect it to more things and give patients more options to see their glucose values where they want to see them. And and that's how G6 and, and, and then G7 will evolve. So, no, it is it is much smaller. In, in all fairness, under our, our clinical trial protocols, I've worn several G7s, and I can tell you I you forget completely that you have anything on your body. Uh, it, it, it is a really different, a very different experience. G6 is a hugely different experience than G5 was. Well, this is, again, even another step up as far as how you would interact with the device physically. And we're really excited about it. One more G7 question, if I can, and that is, the last couple of times we've talked, you have spoken about people with diabetes who use insulin, not just people with type 1 using Dexcom products. Is the G7 going to be geared to people with type 2 diabetes as well? And then I guess my real question is, is the G7 going to be as accurate as the G6? I'm assuming the MARD will be the same. You're not looking to advance a product that doesn't have the same accuracy. I actually, we'd never get off the ground if we didn't perform that way. The new FDA rules for what's called an ICGM, an interconnected CGM, which G6 is the first product ever to be, the rules are very clear, and these products have to perform very well. And it's not just the MARD. It's performance across all ranges of glucose values, and it's consistent performance and elimination of big outliers, or as much as we can eliminate them. And the G7 will have to fit into that same bucket, so it's going to have to be accurate. As far as being geared towards other patients, in all honesty, we have to take care of our insulin-using patients before we worry about anybody else or anything else. These are the people who have stuck by us and work with us for years and the people who have the most acute need for continuous glucose monitoring. But we believe even G6, in all candor, we can start taking to some of these other medical conditions. What becomes different is the experience that a patient has. Somebody with type 2 diabetes, for example, who's not on insulin may not need as much information as somebody uh, with type 1 diabetes giving themselves insulin doses all the time, may not need the alerts and the alarms because there's no life-threatening event that's coming. They may want high alarms because they want to learn things that uh, about nutrition or about not taking meds that they could discover. So for us, if you build the accurate, convenient, top-of-the-line, industry-leading platform as we look forward, what we plan on doing then is creating experiences for different patient groups that will be different and meet their needs and, and put our product into position to be used by many, many people. Uh, one of our biggest supporters, actually, is a physician who is a wellness doctor, and he wears these things all the time. He doesn't have diabetes at all, but he wears a G6 all the time to monitor his glucose values because he believes that is the window to good health. And he has a prescription. He's more than qualified to write himself a prescription and do this and and pay the out-of-pocket cost, but he believes it's that important. And the data that he gathers from that are things he uses to build his programs with uh, his longevity programs. G7 will be such a, a great patient experience and so different. It is fully our intention to take it to other markets, but we will first go to our type 1 patients, those who have been loyal to us forever. It would just be a huge mistake on our part, not to bring it to that market. So we will bring it to our our Dexcom users today. So let's talk about the G6. I have a a list of questions. I put this in the Facebook group, you know, what do you want to know from Kevin Sayer? And many, many of the questions were, why can't I get the G6 to last 10 days? And it's not necessarily that it doesn't stick. It's the sensor failures or other issues. We've been very fortunate. We have not had this as an issue at all. We're prying it off a of Benny at day 10, and we've had very good accuracy. So knock wood, uh, we've been very fortunate. But that seems to be the biggest concern I'm hearing, at least, about the G6. What have you learned from the launch and the use so far? Right back to Kevin's answer to that question. But first, 
Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. OneTouch has been a trusted brand in blood glucose management for more than 30 years. This past year, Pharmacy Times and U.S. News & World Report named OneTouch as a number one pharmacist-recommended brand in blood glucose monitoring devices based on a survey of pharmacists nationwide. Find out more about OneTouch brand products at diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. Now back to Kevin Sayer answering my question about issues with the G6. Well, so I, I'm going to get a little technical here, so bear with me. Uh, with the new standards that the FDA put in place for, again, what's called an interconnected or interoperable continuous glucose monitor, ICGM, these devices have to perform extremely well across all glucose ranges across the entire time a patient wears a sensor. Within the algorithm of our sensor, and that's the software that computes the glucose value after we get the ele electrochemical signal, we have self-diagnostics. And in order to obtain the, the rating, you know, the classification of ICGM, there are times within, within our sensor operating system where we do shut sensors off because it would appear the data would not be as accurate as one would, would expect to be within this ICGM category. This is a new technology and a new way to do things for us, and we did this with the G6 launch. We have seen that we've had more frequent shutoff of sensors and probably sensors that in the past with G5 would have continued running because we didn't have this self-diagnostic program. This is something we will continue to evaluate uh, with our technologies. Uh, as you all know, or, or longtime Dexcom patients know, when we launch a new product like this, it isn't very long after that we launch new algorithms and other features to make the system perform better. And we're now going through that cycle with G6 to whereby, okay, we've identified what your patients are and what your constituents are talking about. How do we resolve this? Is it with a sensor change? Is it with an algorithm change? Is this a function of, quite honestly, we're studying things such as, is this a function of the force with which the automatic inserter inserts the sensor into the body and then pulls out? We're looking at a number of things. It does appear you know, just from my looking at it, that a lot of this is physiological, that there are some patients where this happens and it repeats a lot. For them, there are many patients where this doesn't happen at all. And, and that's most of them. We are all over this. Uh, we have a team that literally, that is all they are looking at now is what's going on here. Fortunately, with the data from the phone app, and for those who are phone users, we now will have a very large database of G6 sensors, and we can go back and look of things of that nature and see what happened. We're not happy that this is happening. Uh, conversely, we've tried to be fair with everybody, and we will fix it, and we will take care of it. But it, it, it's just a learning. Uh, that's all I can tell you, and, and, and we'll learn, and, and, and I'm sorry that people are having that experience, but we'll get past it. It's interesting, too, because, and I can only report anecdotally, and I don't know what you can respond to, it just seems to me that the younger the kid, you know, the thinner the person sometimes, as you said, the way that it's inserted, I was interested that you said the force of the automatic insertion, but sometimes people have said pressing or angling or doing different things. So I guess my question after saying all that is, you're looking at all those things. We're looking at everything. We don't leave any stone unturned. You said something interesting towards the very beginning of our talk today, and that was something along the lines of um, understanding the transmitter. You know, when, when the G7 is completely different, you said something like, well, and people don't always understand the transmitter. I'm curious, what did you mean by that? I, I, didn't mean, I, I didn't necessarily mean understand. Maybe I used the wrong word. It's not people who don't understand it. It's the insurance companies. Uh, I can't tell you how many emails I get from patients frustrated who need to order a new transmitter. And they go to their payer, and the payer makes them start a whole process again with respect to CGM, even though they've been on it for a long time, because this is a durable equipment purchase. So sensors, people understand I have to have a sensor every all the time to wear, and those orders get processed earlier. But I can tell you, I've heard from numerous patients, I've got my sensors, I have everything, my insurance company won't approve a transmitter for me, please help me. And so if we can take one transaction out of the that process, if we can make one step easier for those who pay for the product and for those who use the product, I think it's going to lead to a lot of efficiencies on both sides and make patients much happier. But I've talked to several patients who can get sensors, but the insurance company makes them go through a whole pre-auth and a whole blood glucose log submission and everything for transmitters. Yeah. And, and we do everything we can to get the best possible situation. 
with those who reimburse for our product, but it, it's just hard. That makes a lot more sense because I was trying to figure out what don't I understand about the transmitter? I shouldn't have to understand no, it, too much it's about the it. People who, <laughs> it's the people who pay for the transmitter that don't understand it. Got it. All right. So can you talk a little bit about what happened New Year's Eve with the servers? It seemed like there was an outage here uh, that lasted for some, some time. Can you reassure customers that that issue is resolved? That specific issue has been resolved and that I do not know all the technical uh hmm things behind it that from what I have seen that appears to be an issue that was outside of our control with the server entities and and networks and such that we work with. We have resolved everything that we know. Our big learning there is we need more contingency plans. People can't go without share. And and it is such an important feature to the product. So we will be building stronger contingency plans. We've been working on server architecture as long as we started this project. And, and it's very obvious, given what happened New Year's Eve, we need to buck up and do more. Uh, but this was not a, a DEX cut. This was a, you know, there are a number of providers in in cloud computing uh, that you have to deal with from a network side, from a connectivity side, from those who actually have the servers. And it's my understanding that one of the links along the chain broke and it was completely out of our control and unanticipated, obviously. Uh, we We won't let that happen again. And I guess just to follow up on that, um, and I'm sure it's been pointed out to you, but you know, Dexcom's social media, frankly, is not as responsive as other companies. I mean, the Twitter account is there, but it's never tweeted. And people were looking to that saying, what's going on? Can you help me? It, it, was, it was an example where a social media quick response might have been helpful. Have you all looked at that any place to change that? You know what? That's a very good suggestion. We haven't had a meeting to discuss that yet. We have taken a very conservative social media approach, you know, up to this point in time. Our Twitter account is not overly active. Uh, I don't have a Twitter account where I tweet about every patient letter and everything <laughs> well, that comes in. We, we have been a very conservative company that way. I think that is a real good suggestion and something I need to take back from this podcast that when we have a situation like this, we ought to reach out to our patients through social media in addition to the other things that we do. So I appreciate that. That's a good suggestion. Sure. On another topic, Dexcom acquired Type Zero last summer. I have to say, I am now a big fan of Type Zero since they are the people behind what is now the algorithm in the tandem pumps. We switched to Basil IQ in the fall. We've been very happy with that. And I'm curious, what what's the plan here? I mean, are we going to see additional companies produce systems like that? I mean, are you expanding into? other companies or devices with Type Zero? Can you share anything about that? You know, for today with Type Zero, Tandem has a license to the Type Zero algorithm and the development work for the Type Zero algorithm is being used pretty much exclusively by Tandem. We do have the option since we control the technology to license it to others. We look at this uh, in two ways. For our pump patients, certainly we believe the Tandem offerings with the Type Zero algorithm will be wonderful offerings, and we continue that development effort. And, and we wanted to control that. We looked at the Type Zero company, and we looked at that asset, and we wanted to make sure that that asset really was in good hands because the technology that they've developed and the work they've done with thousands of days of patient trials is something that we couldn't find anyplace else. We have the opportunity, if we want to, to make that an algorithm that could work with other pumps, and we're evaluating that. But the other business aspect we look at type zero and the other thing we want to do with this is really work on the Dexcom experience for all patients, not just just pumpers. You know, most patients around the world do not use insulin pumps. And even in the U.S., that's still a minority. Those who take shots can use better tools. And those who use multiple daily injections can use better tools. And I give you my personal example as I've talked with the engineers about this. There's very little that could be more helpful to a patient than before they go to bed at night, they hit a button saying, what should I do before I go to sleep? And based on if we have insulin in- inputs from a Bluetooth pen, if we have CGM data, if somehow we had some kind of nutrition data, if possible, or activity data, whatever data we can add to that, that system, give a patient some idea what they should do when they go to bed at night. Patients on with multiple daily injections also don't have a bolus calculator that considers glucose trends and whether you're rising or falling before you give yourself a bolus of insulin. We can use that algorithm to develop a tool like that. So what we're looking to do is develop a library of tools for all insulin users and even for type 2 patients to identify trends in data that would indicate something that could be changed to make their lives better or to help them better manage their lives. 
And we feel this technology that, that we've acquired gives us a base to go do a lot of these things. And we look at other technologies in the field. I don't think we're done. Uh, I think we will evaluate technologies developed by others over the next several years and really build a library of tools that can enhance patients' lives. I know you only have a couple of minutes left before you have to go to a meeting. So let me throw another couple of quick questions at you. And I know you won't be able to go into too much detail, but watch with no phone. Are we getting closer to that from transmitter to Apple watch or, or Android? We are, watch? Getting close. we are getting closer to that. And the first one will be an iOS watch. It'll be the Apple watch. And we, that will come in 2019. I won't give you a date, but it will be, available in 2019. We have to do some uh, firmware upgrades to the transmitter uh, to get it ready to do that. And when we can, we will announce that. Uh, Apple has been very helpful in working with us directly. They want patients to have that as well. So that will come in 2019. No question. I was surprised when I asked people what they wanted to know from you. Many, many parents said, more than five followers, please give me all the followers I can possibly have. And I say I'm surprised because we got share when I guess Benny was old enough that I didn't think we needed that many followers. Not something I thought a lot about. Is that in the pipeline at all? Yes, we will increase the number of followers. We have new uh, share and follow configurations also on the docket for some time in 2019 as well. And, and five was a number. In all honesty, it's a number that, that, that I picked because I wanted to make sure it worked before we opened it up to everybody. And, and so we will, uh, Obviously, fix what happened New Year's Eve before we open it up to everybody, but I I certainly think we can have more than five. I don't know what the right number is. I don't want to let everybody have 50, but we can (laughs) certainly do more than five. I know. I was so interested that some people would love 50, and some people will never give more than one person the share. I've talked to children who only let one of the two parents follow them. (laughs) <laughs> they won't. They don't want mom to let dad or vice versa. Uh, it, it, we've created some psychological dynamics with share that actually are worthy of a really interesting paper uh, within families. It's It's been quite a, an experience we never anticipated. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other interview for, for a whole other day. And we've certainly talked about it a lot on the podcast and I'll, uh, you know, more to come. But you, you got to have a conversation with your kid or your spouse or whoever is sharing with you. There's got to be an agreement there on action that the person takes. Because, man, as you said, psychologically, there's some interesting issues that come into play there, not just for kids, um, but for adults not as well. Not just for kids, for yeah. parents as well. Yeah. I did get quite a few thank yous for such a great tool. A lot of people said, please tell him that we, we know we're asking all these questions, but we do love it. So that was really good. And then a, a couple of people did ask about Medicare. Is G6 available currently to Medicare patients? It, it, it is not. Uh, we intend to launch G6 in the Medicare population during the first half of this year, hopefully in Q1. Uh, a lot of this depends upon getting up uh, and enough inventory capacity to launch in, in, into all groups. G6 got approved much earlier than we anticipated. Uh, the FDA approved this product in the spring of 2018, and we were expecting an approval sometime in the, in the fall, giving us several months to build up inventories and a, a rather a slower rollout. When G6 got approved early, we looked at it ourselves around the room. What do we do? We decided we wouldn't withhold it from patients. And what we did is we created a situation where demand for G6, both in the U.S. and our foreign markets, was so strong that we couldn't serve every single patient base, and we had to make some difficult choices. There's some foreign markets we planned on launching in that we haven't launched in yet that we will launch in 19. And we roll we will roll Medicare out in 19. Uh, one of our biggest efforts internally is creating more G6 capacity. And we have certainly capacity to take care of our, our, our current patient base. But what we've seen with G6 so far and its acceptance is we need to plan for a lot bigger patient base, and we need to make a lot more of these. And so we are increasing our capacity. We very publicly stated that's one of our goals for the year. We will roll this out to Medicare uh, here early in 2019. The Medicare patients deserve it. Uh, all patients deserve it. But we just didn't have capacity to, to go everywhere. So we made some hard choices. And that was one that we made. So there doesn't seem to be reluctance on the other side. It's not reluctant. No, it's not reluctant at, at all. Medicare, it's, they're it's not, on board. Yeah, they, they, we, and we will switch them over and we will have a good program for them. And, and, and look, we'll take care of our Medicare patients. So they've become a very large and vibrant part of our business. And, and you'll see us 
definitely take care of those people here in 2019. And then to, to piggyback on that, you mentioned other countries. I always, I have so many listeners in Canada and they keep asking me about this. Is that one of the countries for 2019 or can you say? Yeah, that's, that's scheduled to be a 19 launch as well. I'll be honest with you, Kevin, as we wrap this up here, we often use the Dexcom on non-FDA approved body parts. Back of the arm is probably my son's favorite, and I know many, many people who use it. And a lot of people are very nervous about that because it's not FDA approved. They don't want to tell people that they're putting it there. You know, they're reluctant sometimes to even try it. Any chance that there are going to be more places on the body that you that we get FDA approval from Dexcom? Or is it kind of, I don't even know if you can say something about this. Is it just kind of, you're, you know, people are using it that way? Because let's face it, people with diabetes don't have a lot of real estate on their bodies. They're, they got to rotate everything. So is that something that, that's we, planned at all? Yes, we are planning eventually on running studies on alternate locations. Uh, the G7 certainly is going to be labeled uh, for arm wear. Uh, we are absolutely planning on G7 being an arm and abdomen and upper buttocks uh, type product. And we'll run studies on all those locations. We we have chosen to run studies on the abdomen area because we're familiar with that and we're familiar with how our sensors perform. And we've been able to submit data to the FDA with the sensors in, in that location on a consistent basis. Patients have made their choice and, and wear them in other spots. I can't encourage that, obviously, as CEO here, but I can tell you when I go to many of the meetings, particularly uh, at the Children with Diabetes Conference, in the summer, almost every kid I see has a sensor on the back of their arm, and the last thing I'm going to do is run around and tell everybody to stop. I think it's, <laughs> it's certainly a personal choice, and, and, and we do need to run studies there. We just, you know, we look at all the things on our plate, and what are we going to do, and, and, and we make decisions and allocations and think differently. And in future studies, you'll see us run it on alternative sites. Well, so th that will come. Well, Kevin, I, I really appreciate it. I know there are a lot of wide ranging questions, as always, when we have you on. So thank you so much. And I hope you come back soon and give us some updates. Always a lot going on. Thank you. Thank you for having us again. Uh, and we're just delighted with G6, its acceptance in the marketplace. I, I think it is truly a huge step in continuous glucose monitoring. And, and you're going to see a lot of the things you've talked about on this in this interview happen in 2019. We have a very ambitious year in front of us. So watch for good stuff. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information on Dexcom and, and Verily. We started the interview off about the G7. I'll link all of that up in the show notes. If you're listening on a podcast app, they all have that little more info tab. Sometimes it can be hard to find. So you can always go to diabetes-connections.com and look at the show notes for every episode. I link up a lot more information in case you want to follow up. And if you are listening on a podcast app, why not take a second to rate and review the show? And also just make sure you're subscribed. If you're subscribed, it'll come automatically to your phone each week. No more hunting around for it. And if you're listening, thinking, how do I get a podcast on my phone? If you have an iPhone, you can just tell your good friend Siri all about it. Say, Siri, find Diabetes Connections podcast. Or Siri, subscribe to Diabetes Connections podcast. And she's so helpful. She'll just open it right up for you and help you subscribe. Android is a little bit different. You should be able to do that with your Google Assistant. So if you cannot on Google, let me know. And uh, I'll definitely let you know how to find the show. But again, every place you look on the website in the show notes, I'm even sick of me saying it. It's easy to find ways to subscribe. <laughs> Our community connection this week is all about big changes, but consistency at the powerhouse group beyond type one. Community Connection is brought to you by Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. Earlier this month, Beyond Type 1's board of directors announced that Tom Shear would be the new chief executive officer. Sarah Lucas, uh, she has been in that position since the founding of Beyond Type 1 a couple of years ago, is going to be a member of the board of directors. Now, Tom was uh, the COO since 2015 when the company was founded. And I've talked to Tom before. I'm going to link up our previous interview with him because you know, he was really uh, an interesting choice. And, and those really aren't my words. <laughs> I've talked to Sarah and others at Beyond Type 1 because Tom, at the time, 
didn't think he had any connection to type 1. As you'll actually hear in this interview, he has since realized that some of his friends and people that he knows have it. But he just didn't think he knew anybody. And he came in thinking of this as a job, right? I'm going to stay here for a little while and then move on. And of course, things change the way they do. Now, if you're not sure what Beyond Type 1 is, I would urge you to check it out. They are, you know, honestly, they're a little hard to define, but they are a powerhouse of social media, of technology, of influencers. They are all about education about Type 1. They provide resources and support. It's a really interesting organization that continues to evolve and now includes things like running groups and sitter services and snail mail campaign. It's been interesting to watch them grow in just the past, well, really over three years. So congratulations to Tom, as he is now the new CEO. The other big piece of news from Beyond Type 1 is their announcement introducing Beyond Type 2, a new program to serve and help those people affected by type 2 diabetes. So this is going to be a place, much like Beyond Type 1, I would expect, where people with type 2 and those who love them can share stories and get connected and find resources. It launched in English and in Spanish, which is fantastic. I will link up more information about that. It is uh, going to operate as a program of Beyond Type 1. And when I mentioned those running clubs and babysitting services, those are all programs under the umbrella of the 501c3 nonprofit Beyond Type 1. So lots of information there that I would urge you to check out. Big step forward, big community in Type 2. Going to be interesting to see how they keep it separate and also integrate what they've learned. And I think, you know, you've heard me say this over and over again, if you're a longtime listener, we need these communities to come together more because it only helps. Yeah, I know people get confused and I know you don't want people thinking your kid got type one because they ate too much candy, but we need to stop the shame in the type two community, just like we need to up the education in the type one community. And we need the power of all these numbers to affect change when it comes to things like insulin prices and access to care. Because without working together, in my opinion, this is going to get us nowhere. So I'm thrilled to see this from beyond type one. Now, timing being what it is, I spoke to Tom Shear just a couple of weeks ago, and I had planned to run his interview this week. I usually am able to plan out a schedule a couple of weeks ahead and I things move around, but I, I have a rundown and I put people here or there. So Tom was scheduled to run this week. I didn't realize everything that would be going on. So I have to tell you that this interview was conducted before he became CEO and before Beyond Type 2 was introduced. And what we talk about mostly here is social media and a few of the stories that you may be familiar with, some of the campaigns from Beyond Type 1, like that really successful one they did with Panera last fall. This interview was done at the D-Data Summit, thanks to Diabetes Mine, just after Tom and Beyond Type 1 had done a social media presentation. Presentation. So here's my interview with Tom Shear. When we were in the session yesterday, you did a session on social media that I helped out with a little bit, which was a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, of course. You're welcome. <laughs> but we we're trying to teach people who are not in the social media field or they really don't play in that sandbox that much. What did you learn from that, from talking to those people? Yeah. So it's interesting. Some of it has to do with the audience that's here at the conference. I think... Most of industry in the room would never shy away from the notion of spending money on display advertising somewhere or commercials, for example. But for whatever reason, they don't seem to think about social media as a whole separate thing that holds value both from a marketing standpoint, but also from just a community engagement standpoint. Um, I think for me yesterday, Dana and I, our presentation was trying to open people's eyes to what social media can do as a old school marketing tool, but also for sort of a halo effect for a brand when used right. Well, it also one of the points that I think many people were sitting up straighter at was communicating directly with their customer. And you, you made a point again and again before I let you answer that about you're not selling. Social media mm -hmm. shouldn't be about pushing stuff in their face. But they were kind of shocked, it seemed, that they could contact people this way. Yeah. Uh, it was funny to me the number of questions we got that were in the territory of, wait, you mean I can have actual conversations? I don't, it's, it's not just top down? Um, and we, we shared a number of examples yesterday of brands that do this really well or have sort of loosened the reins on social. I also think for whatever reason, there's an unusual quantity of brands that are still looking at social media with a really heavy eye to compliance and regulation. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't think that that's necessarily the best approach day to day. And there's ways to do it that are within regulatory bounds. And I think we opened up people's eyes to that, too, a little bit. I'm curious, you know, beyond type one, you mentioned, uh, and I had forgotten this, you were you were social media before you were a company. We were an Instagram before we were even a registered corporation, let alone a 501c3. Hmm. What have you learned about people with diabetes in that time on social media? They, they you know, I, I follow so many different accounts where people just want to show I'm living well despite it, or I want to show you all my gear, hmm. or, you know, here's my cute kid. Have you really gleaned anything from the community? Social media is what, it, for, for individuals, social media is what they want to make it. And I think being aware of that and being aware that your social media isn't my social media, isn't her social media, isn't his, is useful when trying to have conversations. So not everybody, and it was funny yesterday, Dana, who was presenting with me, Dana was giving an example about her, like Dana's diabetes Instagram. And then she stopped and she said, I don't actually have a Dana's diabetes Instagram. (laughs) And that's because Dana actually doesn't use social media that way. She doesn't talk a lot about her diabetes on Facebook or Instagram, for example, but sometimes on Twitter. And she'll talk about industry things on Twitter. But that doesn't mean she's not engaging with the diabetes community on Instagram. In fact, she called it inspiring. She pushed people to go look at it. I think she's observing and looking at it day to day for personal reasons, not only professional ones. Beyond Type 1 has so many programs going. at have too many social media accounts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I, I, I'm curious, just kind of peek behind the curtain a little if, you, if you'll let us. You know, how do you manage... I'm trying to remember, you. in the last couple of months, you've added the, the babysitter, the safe sitting, mm-hmm. um, type one run. Uh, uh, you know, you'll have the snail mail program, mm-hmm. which is offline as well. But there are a lot of things that, that Beyond Type One has taken on in the last year or two. You know, how do you handle the social media for that kind of thing and keep your message on brand, as they say? Sure. So I think we talk long and hard before we launch social media tied to a program itself. So we have top-level social media, the equivalent of, like, Beyond Type 1's Facebook page, right? Type 1 Run has a whole bunch of social media outlets, and that's because James and Craig are amazing, (laughs) and they use it to connect with the actual Type 1 Run groups and Type 1 Run members, and people follow those accounts. And when Type 1 Run came under Beyond Type 1, we didn't want to shut off that communication valve. We wanted to foster it. It's, it was sort of a way of engaging with the community and bringing what were those runs into the digital space and vice versa. The flip of that is our snail mail program, I think, only has an Instagram. And it's a branded Instagram that's just about photos of kids primarily sharing photos of their snail mail things. And that's super cute. But it came out of a desire from the community to build it. We would never build or I say never and knock on wood aggressively, I can't anticipate us building a Twitter account for our DKA campaign. We just don't think that it's necessarily effective for the program. So um, for us, we we really do focus on it. The other thing is, is that we really try to think about how the various programs can help other programs yeah. grow. And so if, for example, Snail Mail and the babysitting program, Safe Sittings, well, those are perfect. They go together really well. So it's important to me that on snail mail, we're promoting safe sittings and making sure that families that are involved in snail mail know about our babysitters program. Uh, and similarly, that safe sitters, safe sittings has knowledge of these other programs, perhaps for the kids that they're getting babysitters for. So we work really hard to try to cross pollinate where we can. Um, it's a challenge, though. It's a lot. We have a lot going on. Um, I, I'll add sort of my one other thing on it. I don't... At Beyond Type 1, it's not like we're sitting in a room somewhere and writing a message on a, on a board and then putting the board on a wall and saying, this whole week is mental health week. Like, we're not doing the political equivalent of, uh, you know, like, this week is education week. We're not doing that as much. We have our moments where we want everything to be focused on one announcement. And in those instances, we get the whole org on board with that thing. But it's pretty rare. We want social media to feel authentic and quick, and we want to be responsive. And yesterday, that meant we needed to move some stuff around to make room to talk about Tidepool and Insolet's announcement. And that was exciting. And I'd have no reason to delay that. We wanted to be able to talk about it. One of the recent campaigns that you did very successfully was working with Panera. Mm -hmm. And that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I got 
was, where does the money go? So let's talk about Panera and the campaign. And then if you don't mind answering that question, because that was something that offline a few people messaged to me because they knew I was here with you. They saw that yesterday. So so the Panera campaign, and you can probably explain it better, though, was you partnered with Panera to raise money and awareness. And people just put little hearts. We all, and I retweeted it, we put hearts out. And for every heart, Panera was going to give some money. And it was you had to shut it down before you before they expected, right? So the the original hope was to run. Uh, the plan was like, uh, effectively a week, and I don't think we sort of decided on it. But I think mentally we were all assuming it was going to be around a week. And at thirty six hours, Panera posted across all of their social platforms that they had increased the maximum donation, which had been thirty thousand to sixty thousand. They were thrilled with the response. They were impressed by the response from their community, our community, the greater diabetes community, um, and that they were giving us sixty thousand dollars and calling it a success. <laughs> and so were we. It was a tremendous win. The conversations are ongoing this week about Food Interrupted, which is their campaign. And Sam Talbot, our one of our co-founders, was involved in that campaign. So those conversations about sugar and health and diabetes, which we all know can be sometimes a sensitive set of topics, are ongoing. But the campaign itself was a splashy and fun 36 hours. It was. It was. It was really nice to see. I think we get very excited in the diabetes community when a, a different brand gets involved when somebody that we don't think of as one of the regulars Hmm. pops in and wants to do good. And then I got that question, where does the money go? Sure. So we have a unique funding model, first off. So something people don't know about us is if you, like Stacey, if you whipped out your phone and went to beyondtype1.org slash donate and made a donation, 100% of that donation is going to our programs or grants. And I'll come back to that. Um, But 100% of it, we don't take any operational cut. So all of our operations are funded by our leadership, so our board and leadership council, as well as a very small number of incredibly gracious donors who explicitly fund operations for us. And then every now and then, a corporate partner will come in and give us a gift that is tied to operations. But what that allows is, is in the community, 100% of the money is going back to our portfolio of programs and grants. Uh, In that vein, what we focus on in terms of the portfolio is a mix of our own programs, things like the Snowmill program or the DKA campaign or any number of our programs and content online. Those are the programs we run and the money funds that. The money also funds grants that we give out. And we don't do massive grants, but if you head to our website, you can see grants that we've done. We are really excited to have been able, for example, in the really early days of Tidepool, to give Tidepool a grant. We've done some grants in the Cure Research space, uh, but where we really find that we can make real progress in terms of a lot of our grant dollars, it goes to education and advocacy, where somebody may be doing something really impressive, and they need a little bit of money to be able to make that happen. And so we gave a grant to Asha Brown and We Are Diabetes, aimed at eating disorder awareness and in the type 1 space, there's nobody doing that better than Asha and that organization. And so for us, we don't need to go build out a whole thing on that. We need to fund Asha and help her do that. So we, our focus when we get money in is to ensure that our programs are stabilized and that they're running. And then second to that is to be able to give grants that help in the space with education, advocacy, and hopefully the path to a cure. Tom, when I first talked to you, I was surprised to find out that you do not have type 1. I do not. You do not really have a big personal or before this uh, connection to diabetes. What's it been like for you? So it's funny. The other day, Tom Carlia and I were on the phone and Tom said to me, you better never tell someone again that you don't have a personal connection to type (laughs) 1. When I started in the space, I had no connection that I knew of which I think is the common thing about type 1, is that, you know, it's so often invisible and and people aren't seeing it. And I came to find out I actually had multiple friends who had type 1, and I was unaware of that. Um, These days, I have so many people who I love and care about and work with who either have type 1 or are impacted directly by type 1, and I now consider myself somebody who is impacted by type 1, given the quantity of loved ones and, and people that I'm passionate about who have type one or an immediate connection. It's been really humbling. I think I've come in and I've seen a space that is filled with people that are so devoted 
to trying to make a difference and trying to help people live the best lives they can. And we see that every day. And I, so I find it really humbling. I'm really honored to work in the space. Um, when I first came into the space, I didn't think that I was going to stay around in diabetes for that long. I, the original vision was that I was going to be at Beyond Type 1 for about three months. And that was what Sarah Lucas and I had sort of agreed to. And it's been little over three years, three years and four or five months now. And to be honest, I don't see myself leaving anytime soon, Stacey. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I love the work that we do, and I, I love where Beyond Type 1 is heading. And, and to be honest, where I think the entire diabetes landscape is heading. I think we're making really good strides for people. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Thank you. More information about Beyond Type 1, about the campaigns that Tom talked about there. Also, of course, about the new Beyond Type 2 and all of the new information. It's all linked up in the show notes or at diabetes-connections.com. And in an interesting bit of synergy, don't you love that word? Real Good Foods, one of my wonderful sponsors, is also one of the big supporters, one of the five founding partners of Beyond Type 2. So way to go, Real Good Foods. And Tell Me Something Good, our new weekly segment, is brought to you by Real Good Foods. You know, when Benny comes home after school, and even my daughter Leah still, they are so hungry. And, you know, dinner's not going to be ready for a while. And it's really easy for them to just, you know, grab some junk or, or something to fill up. I could lie and tell you that I cut up vegetables every day. And we always have super low carb, fresh veggies and snacks all over the house. And there are days, it's usually Monday and Tuesday when I'm all organized and that happens. But then later in the week, <laughs> you know. I love real good foods and I appreciate them because the cauliflower crust pizzas, the poppers, you know, it's in the grocery store or the Walmart freezer. I bring it home. They can throw it in the toaster oven and they can enjoy some really great lower carb, good tasting stuff without a lot of fuss and bother. Benny loves the pizza with everything on top of it. Leah has a more plain taste, so she does not go for that. But Real Good Foods makes it easy, no matter what you like. Find out more, just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. In the first year of the podcast, I found a group called Will's Way. This is a nonprofit there in um, Indiana, and they basically serve families that are affected by type one and are underinsured. You know, they have insurance, but they have these high deductibles and co-pays. So they really can't afford their supplies, even though they are covered. So Will's Way provides grants. One is for durable medical equipment, things like insulin pumps and CGMs. And the other, they just make an emergency cash grant, you know, to help people in crisis afford daily diabetes supplies, insulin, test strips, alcohol pads, you know, I mean, uh, cartridges, the things that you know as, as your build for these things are built differently. Will's Way was founded by Lisa Oberndorfer, who is the mom of Will. Will was diagnosed back in 2012 while he was in middle school, and, and they wanted to do something. And this is what they came up with. Now, I'll link up the episode we did with Lisa because she explains more about it. They have a, as we all do, you know, they have a diagnosis story. I'd love for you to go back and listen if you've never heard it. But the reason they are our Tell Me Something Good segment this week is because I saw on Facebook that they hit a huge milestone. And I'll read you the post. Today is an historic day at Diabetes Will's Way. I am so proud to say we just awarded our 100th grant. This organization brings so much joy and relief to so many deserving families. Thank you to these families for trusting us. We are honored to serve you. And here is a picture of Braxton, grant recipient number 100. And there is a picture, of course, of Braxton, the young man who has received the grant. Lisa didn't write in to tell me. She doesn't know that I'm putting her in the show this week. But I just thought this is a program that doesn't get a lot of publicity, that isn't helping a million people, but that have helped a 100 families in an incredible way. And they will continue to help. So I'll put up all of their information in the show notes and, and the interview we did uh, a while back. So thanks for all you do. I hope Will is doing great because his family, and I know he's involved as well, are doing great things. If you want to be featured in Tell Me Something Good, drop me a line, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. 
Tell me about something good that happened or somebody that you saw doing good. Milestones. You've got the idea if you've listened recently. I love this segment. And yeah, you never know. I could be hunting you down on Facebook and saying nice things about you. (laughs) Okay, before we go, let me tell you a little bit about our most recent endo visit. Now, as you know, I don't talk numbers. It's not my story anymore. It's Benny's. And I don't think specific numbers help anybody anyway. But I have shared with you that in September, we started with Basil IQ. Maybe it was the very end of August. Basil IQ is the tandem algorithm. It works in the T-Slim X2 pump. It works with the Dexcom G6 CGM. The two communicate. And if the blood sugar gets too low or is falling too fast, the pump shuts off insulin. It is as simple as that. Well, there's actually a little bit more to it, but that's probably the easiest way to explain it. So we started that in September. Almost exactly a month later, we started on an untethered regimen. Untethered or pumper on long acting insulin, poly, is where you use an insulin pump, but you also take a shot of long acting insulin. There are many reasons why you might do this. I've talked about this before. We did it because Benny is using so much basal insulin as a 14 year old boy that he was not only going through cartridges more quickly than we would have liked, he was really going through insets more quickly because if you push too much insulin at once through these things, they really just don't last. So we were having to change the inset every day and a half, two days at most instead of three days. So we switched to that. Very curious now, three months later, to go to the endo and see what we got. What we got was some really interesting results. I guess the bottom line is his A1C did drop almost half a point, which is great. But you know what? Over the last two years, we've kind of fluctuated in this up and down, half a point here, half a point there, almost every time. But what was different this time? And I wasn't thinking this way until my endo pointed it out. It came down that half a point with virtually no lows. He had, I want to say, less than 1% of his time in those three months was low. And he had no urgent lows. And I should say, if you're not familiar, an urgent low is 55 on our settings. So to end up with a lower A1C and far fewer low blood sugar numbers is, in my opinion, a pretty big win. And that's how our endo saw it as well. He said, you know, you're having better standard deviation, more time and range. You've got to dial back and look at the whole picture. And then he said he could see that um, we we did a little bit of a deeper dive. Benny needs more basil. And I got to be honest with you, I know he's only 14, but I was kind of hoping we were done upping the basil. I mean, I feel like that's all we've done (laughs) since he turned 11. But my friends with teenagers who've been through this before hold my hand and tell me it's going to be okay. So we increased the traceba and we'll see what happens. You know, it never ends. But I just thought I'd share that with you because I think it's going to be interesting as more and more systems are introduced in the next few years, we're all going to have to kind of get used to new ways of measuring things. I know that the A1C is the standard, but even so, we're looking more and more at in-range standard deviation, those kinds of numbers as being just as, if not more important. And when we are seeing more, you know, the artificial pancreas or or hybrid closed loop systems coming out, I think it's going to be very encouraging and very interesting to watch. So that was just our little experience. And of course, I'll, I'll keep you posted as we move forward. Quick housekeeping, get your questions in. Maura McCarthy and I are going to be taping another Dear D-Mom segment very soon, and we'd love to have your questions. And of course, if you ask a question, and you can do that in the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group, you will enter to win Maura's amazing book, Raising Teens with Diabetes. Yes, she is one of my friends holding my hand, telling me this will all be okay. And next week, we are starting something new on the show. Once a month, I'm going to be taking a deep dive into a topic, talking to a healthcare provider about things like insulin or ketones or glucagon, the basic stuff that we really want more information about from our doctors, but often don't have time or we're told about so early in our diabetes education that it doesn't even make sense. So I'm going to be bringing that to you once a month. Let me know what you think when this starts coming out. I just feel like if, if we can have more endocrinologists and CDEs talking to us about these issues, it can really help. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. And hey, I'm 12 years in. I am still learning so much. Big thank you to my editor, John Buchanan, from Audio Editing Solutions. And a huge thank you to you as you listen. Boy, you know, there's a lot going on in these shows these days. I appreciate you listening, letting me know what you think, letting me know what you'd like to hear more of, 
or less of, I can take it. And please feel free to always drop me a line in the Facebook group or anywhere on social media. And don't forget to share the show. Recommend it to somebody you know who is touched by type 1. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.